All right, thank you. Um, just a quick, uh, from the University Labs of Fairbanks, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Art Region Supercomputing Center in Fairbanks for, um, as a resource, and also just to say I'm uh, heavily involved with computational infrastructure for geodynamics, CIG, and also GAC, Southern California Earthquake Center, and, and some of the ideas have certainly been influenced by participation in these and these efforts, which uh, are definitely aligned with some of the goals um, the first few sounds like. This is in the title. I start with a wave field simulation. Um, this is southern Alaska. This is Anchorage here, an earthquake. This is Cook Inlet. This is Marine. To the extent that you see topography in this image, that's the actual top of the uh, the finite element mesh, so that's, that, that, that's what you see is kind of the scale that is being resolved. And so this is going to hopefully, for those of you who don't look at simulations, give you science sort of a quick overview of what an earthquake looks like in certain complex settings. So this is a simulation. You can see scattering due to the wave field. You see a very pronounced effect, effect happening right here. That's due to a massive uh, four-arc basin in southern Alaska. Um, this is, on, this is on a scale which is not shown, um, but sort of Southern California scale model, a few hundred kilometers here. And the effects that are in here, my talk is going to go in two directions from this. One is what do we do with three-dimensional models and simulations? How can we use that to improve our characterization of Earth structure? And also, how did we even get there to start with? Uh, this is not starting with a layered model simulation wouldn't look so interesting. So we're going to look at how we build models, and both of those aspects involve uh, using data at, at different levels. So some topic of workflow has come up. Um, this, my, the, the research in this talk is, uh, is mine, so the topic is going to be kind of aligned with computational seismology, but I hope to make connections to at least a couple other fields, at least with, with inner sciences. This is how, where we start. Um, there is the collection of information, geometric information, topography, the symmetry, logo surface, geometric parameters defining the Earth. <laughs> There's the volumetric characterization and seismology that would be VP, VS, density. How are these characterized as a function of space? Where do we get information that even describes that model? I'll go into that later. Once we have this representation of information, we need to put it in a manner that allows us to do physics, which in this case is simulate waves going through them uh, in elastic or anelastic medium. This is a finite element mesh for Southern California. This is Los Angeles, salt and trough. Um, a hexahedral mesh, um, that's one key aspect of this workflow. Once that is adequately achieved, you can run the simulation, which is the movie that you just saw. So these are the kind of ingredients that move up to that. Once we have the simulation, if it is a decent representation of the Earth's structure, then we have synthetic seismograms. We have little wiggles, but they're not the real ones that happen on seismometers. They're, in this case, the red ones compared with the observed ones, which are black. So we're looking at a comparison between observed time series and recorded time series. This folds into a basic optimization problem where we're looking at the misfit between two different things. In this case, a lot of observed seismograms with a lot of synthetic seismograms. And this part of doing how you use the wave field simulations to improve the representation of Earth structure, I'll touch on a little bit since it's central to where I think things are going in, this, um, in, 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 the, in the field of computational seismology and how we improve the models, but that really won't be the emphasis of my talk. I do want to at least explain where that comes in. This theme has come up, is starting to come up more in this, over the course of the day, uh, that is scientific reproducibility. And the way that um, when I was thinking about this talk, the first question I had was fundamentally, you know, first question is how hard is it for, for me to reproduce my own work? Um, and then the next question is the hard one, how hard is it for someone else to go through um, this whole procedure, who's an expert, how about who's not an expert? And, you know, the, the, the first iteration of that workflow was about three years in my thesis. So, you know, a question of also how long will it take me to reproduce this is, is another question. But this is where, this is driving the theme of some of these aspects, and I put kind of a qualitative good and bad in these categories. 
And you, the time kind of goes from top to bottom in this category. I'm going to come back to this slide at the end. There's the construction of a 3D reference model. Uh, we, in our group, we talked about using, say, proprietary software such as GoPad that also comes up in the cyber infrastructure report, or ad hoc stitching of VPVS data, industry data, seismic reflection, gravity data, whatever you have, the Earth is not 1D, and so <laughs> that information has been collected. It's a question of can you get your hands on it? Can you represent it in a way that will actually give you a better starting point? That's a, that's a really ugly process. And it's, um, I'm not even suggesting that's where Earth Cube go, but I'm just putting it where it is in the column here. Once you have that, there's the extraction of the model. There's two tools, the SCET Community Modeling Environment, IRIS EMC provide examples. This is way um, easier said than done. Once you have the 3D information, how do you extract it in the format that you need it in? But those are two example tools um, that, that are there. The meshing in terms of simple meshing, where I write SVN, that means subversion control, where the codes are being stored, you know exactly what version you're working on. So in terms of keeping track of open source software, this is a starting point. I mean, open source and everything is under version control. Um, for simple meshing, which could be very large models, even the Southern California ones, there are tools that have been developed that make it easier for other people to use this, however, for complex meshing, people like Brad Agard, um, Emmanuel Castrozzi, this is a really huge bottleneck in what we're doing. Um, Qubit, for example, is proprietary software, not easily uh, to even get paid license for, really. So that's where the meshing stage is. Actually doing the wave propagation, getting raw uh, 3D synthetics, that's, that's a really high point of it. Once you have the things in place, running the codes, there's web portals to get 3D synthetics. But these other aspects are kind of critical for doing a particular problem you might be interested in. Also, gold standard is, you know, in terms of data, is the IRIS DMC is, is one of these uh, examples. Where getting waveforms is no problem. I do put in here station metadata uh, as a reminder where this might be a small, maybe it's just within IRIS that it could be uh, solved. But Today, someone could make a change in metadata that affects the last 10 years of that station. Maybe it was discovered it was misaligned. <coughs> but the idea of scientific reproducibility, you need to know that because there are papers published on those waveforms. So there are waveforms which never change. But in terms of deconvolving or turning it into ground motion, that's where the metadata are key. So it's kind of a technical point, but an example where you think deeply about reproducibility, you need to know exactly when you got the waveform, what version that metadata were tied to, and, and those things uh, those things matter. Um, going to validation, which is one of my interests, uh, is, is really saying, if I have this model and another set of earthquakes, how can I use different information to test the quality of the model? What other pieces of information can be used? Um, in this case, say there's a, a Southern California model, the next 100 earthquakes that happen in California, you could run simulations, generate synthetic seismograms, and evaluate any particular misfit function of your choice, maybe it's waveform difference, travel time, whatever you want, and probe a model with, with independent data. Again, there's some tools on this uh, subversion control at the CIG, but this is not uh, this is even towards, the, in terms of another user using this, this would be challenging. And finally, the delivery of all projects. Product. The IRIS EMC uh, is the Earth Model Center, maybe? Um, Earth Model Collaboration. Collaboration. It's, I, I just uh, became familiar with it. There's a lot of information there, extraction, visualization, great product. In the case of the models I'm talking about, there's simply more information. There may be um, uh, there's 3D parameters, earthquake source parameters, uncertainties, the mesh used to run the simulation, 3D synthetics, if you don't want to rerun, why should everyone have to rerun the, the simulations to get the 3D synthetics? These are, by the way, also being delivered by, can be delivered by IRIS. The data to extract them or the commands that were used to extract those exact data and metadata from IRIS. Time windows for the misfit function, processing scripts for data and synthetics. There's a lot of information that would make something truly reproducible. And that's sort of the theme where um, if you go towards delivering the full information that's needed for some of these uh, models, uh, more and more, more uh, outlets to, to get them there would be needed. I'll put this up here just to say in terms of data, there's a few background slides.
wise for non seismologists, but I would say we're in this beautiful, excruciating position where no matter how well we fit recorded waveforms, you can always find high quality, uh, higher frequency waveforms that you can't fit. So it's not like we don't have enough data. I mean, we always want more data and more stations, but on an individual seismogram, we, don't, we can't fit it. I mean, there's too much information. A high frequency is not noise. It's just there's a lot of information there, and we have very few points in terms of uh, on the surface of Earth. So here's, here's a three-component waveform, red is synthetic, black is data, for an earthquake below the Los Angeles Basin, traveling out to the Mojave. And this is a very nice example of sort of two seconds and longer, a full waveform fit to the data, where um, this is a good scenario, but I could easily turn this down to one second or a half second or uh, higher frequency, and this fit would not, would not be present. So it's not that we're lacking. Uh, it's it's really about we're trying to extract as much out of existing waveforms. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a few things about the crust. So I want to get some quick overview of what is the sensitivity of different waves into the crust. So how, in this case, uh, an example of how Rayleigh waves and Love waves sample the crust at different periods. So by using different pieces of information manifested as wiggles on seismograms, those wiggles are getting mapped to different structural parts uh, of a three-dimensional volume, and that allows us to do imaging. So those are surface waves uh, uh, and, and body wave representation. You may have turning waves, a wave that bounces off the moho, or diffracted waves. Um, this is body wave information that's also captured on seismogram. To take this to the step to where it comes into the, the simulation category, the basic idea is that in these inversions, um, a particular pulse on a synthetic seismogram, so we're looking at the top of a simulation for a one-dimensional model, <laughs> you're able to map using these, the simulations, you can map exactly what this little wiggle looks like, how it sees the volume. This, this turns, this is a moho here, so this turns out to be some combination of a diffracted and a moho reflected phase. But the point is, is that the, the codes can be used to illuminate the regions of the structure that a particular pulse is sensitive to. So once you put in real data, the misfit between, say, um, an observed wave that comes in here and the one that you simulate in your seismogram should, should, should occur somewhere in the volume that is highlighted in this particular pulse. So that's how the sensitivities can be illuminated, and that's ultimately the workhorse behind the technique. Um, a last technique slide is to say that the basic idea is that there, uh, to, when, you, when you categorize the misfit function between your synthetic seismogram and observed seismogram, the ability to represent the derivative of your misfit function with respect to your model parameters, say VP, VS is a function of space, involves this uh, interaction between a forward wave field on the left column and what's called an adjoint wave field in the, in the second column, which, which represents a set of mini wave fields that are emanating from the station. They represent some weight based on the residuals between data and synthetic. It sounds a bit like magic when, when it's uh, explained, but it's the interaction in the third column between these two wave fields that, they, that it illuminates or paints a picture of exactly how you need to change your model for each earthquake in order to reduce the misfit that you measure. So that was one slide to say why simulations matter toward making, um, improving our three-dimensional model. It's not what I'm going to focus on here. And for a real example, this is in Southern California. This volumetric model, you can think of it as a tomographic model in the sense that for this one earthquake, for this three-dimensional starting model, this is showing you how you need to perturb your three-dimensional model in order to reduce misfit between data and synthetic over a set of time windows where you don't necessarily know what you're measuring, but it's close enough by some automated procedure to tell you that you're close enough within this realm to make a measurement. So that's the side of, of improving these 3D models. I'll now go back to kind of constructing them at the start. Where do we get there in Southern California? Oh, sorry, one more slide to say what kind of data are involved. These are a set of earthquakes for that particular problem. Um, and there's a few hundred earthquakes, a few hundred stations. We're looking at maybe 60, 70,000 seismograms um, per iteration of the model. So that this is, is a data intensive if you uh, quality control it. 
uh, which of course do. Um, this shows, and so that gives you a sense of what kind of data are going in size and waveform uh, strictly. So case study, building a 3D reference model for Alaska. That is to say at the outset I, I will use or I believe in, um, there's topography, there's a MOHO which enough studies have, have illuminated even in Alaska, and there's three-dimensional crust, especially in active tectonic settings, which happens to be where you find a lot of seismic instrumentation, not surprisingly. So to integrate this information at the outset, um, this is a, a MOHO map. This is not, not a great scale, but this is a sort of 1,000-kilometer scale or something. That's Fairbanks, Anchorage. This is the Yakutat block. This is the Denali Fault. And this is a, a representation of, say, eight data sets stitching together to show MOHO variation goes from 10 to 50 kilometers or so. Those are big variations. So you can imagine that if that's happening and there's a contrast, that's information you want to incorporate. There might be um, the USGS performed a monumental transect across Alaska over probably decades of work, active source experiment, which provided this cross section here. So it's a super, just a massive effort of information, and yet, you know, it's also a two dimensional flight. So it's a challenge to say, what, what do I do with this? You know, I'm, I'm doing 3D simulations, I'm trying to do a 3D tomographic model, and yet extremely strong constraints happen here, and, you know, I have to kind of guess how far that might go. I'm giving you an example of the kinds of decisions that at least one might be faced with wherever they are. Um, you can find probably some kind of transect. Uh, of, of information and how, how to use it. Well, fortunately, there are three-dimensional tomographic models. Um, there is a tomo DD using relocated seismicity and body wave earthquakes done by uh, Eberhard and Phillips. So this shows the region of that model. This shows kind of a classic tomographic is flight, flight to model, show show what they look like in different cross-sections. Things are smeared out where the uncertainty is higher. Um, so that's, that is, is great that there's some information out there that might be used to start with. And then when we kind of come across this, when, when, it, when it gets down to the point of, well, okay, I'm going to go use this. This cross-section looks great. There's a middle Tanenaw Basin here. This is a Cook Inlet Basin. There's oceanic crust and maybe a basin here. But then, you know, you pull that out, and that, that model represents these dots, so there's nodes with values. So this is the actual, so you pull out the data set, and here's one cross-section. And so you're faced with all kinds of questions. How do I interpolate this? This, this one dot was interpreted as this, this, you know, this is the basin that it kind of represents. So you're interested in structure of the scale of topography or basins. You have this information to start with. There's all kinds of questions that a user would have to face with that has a huge impact on the synthetic size of grant. How do you choose to interpolate this can have a dramatic effect, whether you use a default creaking algorithm or some sort of spatial smoothing. These are questions that ultimately you'd like to be left to some other standards. Um, it's, not, it's not even something that someone would discuss in a paper, you wouldn't even know how they went from one model to another. So it's an aspect that is a challenge of, of building this together. This is in Southern California. If you're fortunate enough, this happens to be a GoCAD view of uh, fault models. These are stacking seismic, 2D seismic lines. These are oil wells, so there's direct measurements of BP, maybe BS, maybe density. This is a USGS basin surface. There's a lot of information uh, where there's active tectonics and basins. There's often oil, which means there's data, and uh, which also means there's data that's difficult to come by. Um, and, but it's there, and it's, it's kind of, we all know it's painful when you know that data is out there, and you're just trying to get a model for the greater good, and you can't get it. But um, that's, that's a side issue. Uh, but the point is, where there's data is worth, you know, how to incorporate that into building the model. Why do I care about basins? This is one figure showing um, the same earthquake from the movie I showed at the beginning. This is the Cook Inlet Basin where the, the state has released the basement surface, which is great. Um, there's no information about what's above it, but at least there's a basement surface. And this is looking at data, just showing from a station going from west to east. A very nice example that just shows the kids' peaceful dot. Now, once you're off the edge of the basin, amplitudes are down, ground motion is, 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 uh, is much shorter. 
And these are ultimately, I think, from the societal perspective and from the something that's sampling this, this feature, these are the waveforms we're ultimately interested in as, as well as the others. On the other hand, in central Alaska, you may establish a few gravity, a few points of gravity data to work with. Whatever you have, this is the information. This is what the, the VF looks like going into a particular model. These are hexahedral elements. kind of gives you a sense of going from the model to the um, implementation of the mesh that goes into the simulation. From that, we have some comparison between data in blue and red is the synthetic. So this is for an earthquake near Mount McKinley going to, say, 12 or 14 broadband stations. This is at two seconds and longer. So I filtered this pretty uh, short period in order to show these capabilities. But at this point, you have two things that you can measure. You have an optimization problem, a minimization problem. That's where you can now go toward um, trying to improve the model. Regarding validation, there are many different choices of misfit. Or just uh, my in schedule and sketch goals, the ability to have a, a facility that can take in two models, arbitrary set of earthquakes, evaluate 10 or 20 different misfit functions, and assess tomographic models, anyone's model potentially. That's something that would be a tremendous tool to have. Um, we. In, in, in my earlier work, we looked at uh, waveform differences and evaluations using different measures, holding uh, other events, independent events as a, a separate means to evaluate these changes. I'm going to go back to this slide just as a reminder of, of where this workflow is. Um, and just to say that for this Southern California model, you know, I have to say this 20 gigabytes or so of information that I think I would want to know about a particular tomographic model. Um, so that's kind of the level of information for some of these models. I don't have much on uncertainties. There could be much more complicated models with um, faults that are offset in the mesh. People are working in the room are working on things like that. Um, so that's uh, maybe a starting point for some discussion. And one advertisement to say there is a biennial CIG Quest Seismic Imaging Workshop next summer, and there will be some related topics uh, on, on this. So please check out the web page. Um, this is joint with the European Union uh, Quest project. Thank you. What do you see as the uh, perhaps cognitive difference that might be going into someone who goes and tries to reproduce your model versus um, yourself has taken great pains to uh, create it and create it from scratch in a way that somebody who is maybe modeling a, a, a more downstream portion of it um, wouldn't have that experience and just comment on that, that difference. The difference between building a 3D model from all the different parts or doing the inversion itself? Yeah, yeah. So, so something that could be more of a downstream process, but if you made your data, if your data was available, um, versus, you know, constructing it from the very uh, raw parts that, that you described here. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I missed this. Just re ask it again. If, if, for example, someone wanted 3D synthetics from this model, that would be, uh, you know. You want to know what is my earthquake in Southern California? What are the synthetics look like in that model? Is that considered downstream? Or sure. Okay, so that that's something that I would say much easier doable than say trying to construct a model from scratch, which is done by Harvard Structural Geology full-time scientific staff assembling all this information. Doing the inversion itself is more reproducible because everything we do is at least under subversion control. Codes are there. We have documentation. There's a pretty good um, tradition of documenting how to do things. Uh, but in terms of time and effort to, to, to do the inversion on this model, you know, if it would be faster, someone having done it. But uh, doing the inversion is a big challenge. But we're hoping that these techniques are used more. Um, in terms of getting information from the model, but like that, that, that's, a, that's relatively easy um, to do. And I, I guess the, the point of the question is more, um, do you see a worry in people using them outside of context or uh, without, without as much? Um, you know, I guess that's, that's the risk you take. You put it out there, you can't control it, but I, I don't have a 
you know. I, I don't have a problem with that. Maybe, maybe I have to wait until someone totally blows it up. <laughs> uh, the short one, yeah, but yeah, well, I think that I know, a different point is, is sort of most people, or in a lot of places, we don't have the high resolution 3D models. So it's, what are people doing? I mean, in some places, people are using a 1D model. Sometimes the fault geometry is only a plane rather than the complex geometry. And so they're throwing away, either they're throwing away information because they don't feel like they have the tools to do it, or that information isn't available. Or it's, it's difficult to assemble from, it's certainly like difficult to assemble. <laughs> um, and there, uh, but yeah, where it doesn't exist, you know, you, it, you, you the ability to improve it is tied to how much good seismic data coverage you have. So if you have neither good seismic data coverage nor an active source survey, there's nowhere to go with the inversion. But um, usually there is information, it's just painstaking. I was thinking more on, form, of, on the forward side. Uh, trying to forward, do forward calculations, not, terms, not necessarily in the inversion. Yeah, so you're saying why do a forward calculation if you don't have an accurate model or you're... Well, people do it anyway. I know. Um, <laughs> I, it's good to get the infrastructure established, but, um, but that's usually still proof of concept in some of these cases. I know.